You know, over the years, I have written quite a bit, but I've never mastered the art of a distraction-free writing experience. If you're anything like me, today's interview will change your working life by solving this problem at the source. This is the 5 a.m. Miracle, episode number 364, Distraction-Free Writing with FreeWrite founder Adam Lieb. Good morning, I am Jeff Sanders, and this is the podcast dedicated to dominating your day before breakfast. My guest today is an award-winning product designer and mechanical engineer with a degree from MIT. He is obsessed with product design, especially in relation to user experience and user interaction. Currently, he spends most of his energy as a co-founder at Astro House in Detroit, Michigan. In his role there, he ideated, designed, launched, and saw through to mass production the free write, distraction-free writing tool. And I'm honored to have Adam Lieb here on the show. Adam, welcome to the 5A Miracle Podcast. Thanks for having me, Jeff. Let's just kick this off today with a bit of your backstory. I'm really curious, you know, as a guy myself who loves focus and I love to cut distractions, um, what's your story of, of being interested in that topic and wanting to realize, like, I, I need more focus or I want to cut distractions or I want to be able to do better work? Uh, when did that begin for you? Yeah, I don't think I did this on on purpose, but I think I have I became a productivity junkie, I think, when I started working for myself. You know, it's it's one thing to waste somebody else's time, but it's it's another thing to waste your own time. And so I think I, I started becoming, well, I started my first company after my first job um, after college in 2011. So um, yeah, I guess it's been a while. Um, even before that, when I was in high school and, and you know, in, in middle school, I was even, you know, selling things and, you know, doing the eBay business as many people do. But um, I, I've been focused. I mean, productivity has sort of been my, I don't know, it's sort of been my common thread in a lot of the things that I have been paying attention to. Um, my background is as a mechanical engineer. I graduated from MIT with a degree in mechanical engineering and a focus in product design and sort, sort of um, found my niche in sort of how productivity relates to those things. And and, and that really just comes down to my interests um, in not wasting time and um, you know, really just sort of making the most of what we have. What would you say is probably the biggest issue with distractions? I know that my kind of personal story there was that I had a day job and I was trying to get stuff done. And I noticed that my coworkers were my biggest distractions. And I was trying to find every possible way to you know unplug my phone and, you know, disable the, uh, the chat ma- manager on my computer, like everything I possibly could. Like, what do you think it is about distractions that are an issue for most people? Or why do we need uh, devices to help us focus? So there's actually been some science out there. There was a study out of UC Irvine that says it takes 25 minutes on average to refocus on the original task after a single interruption. And so there is a real downside to dis- distractions. I don't think you really need much research to tell you that, as, as you have found out and, and all of us probably have. I think, you know, for for all of us living in the modern digital age, we are sort of bombarded all the time with distractions and you know, companies and products and services trying to get our attention. And so, you know, we've never been more connected, but not only can we access everything, but everything can sort of access us. And so I think the, I mean, the problem is that you, if you're, if you're getting distracted, then you're sort of losing your train of thought, right? And you're losing your context, which I think is even a bigger problem, which is why it takes probably so long to get back into what you're doing. And so, you know, like you, I've, I've sort of tried everything as well. Um, but ultimately, it's it's you know it's it's how you value your time. I think. Yeah, it's a good point. I've noticed that you know whenever I am working on a project that I care about, then distractions seem a lot more distracting. But <laughs> when I'm working on things that I don't care about, <laughs> yeah. I'm fine to have somebody interrupt me. I'm fine to take a phone call. I'm fine to do you know, to take a coffee break because what I'm working on doesn't really matter. So I think it's interesting that you know our prioritization of our projects, I think, leads itself to us wanting to have more focus. Uh, and speaking of that, you know, I, I've written a couple of books myself, and I'm a, I love to write, and I know that you have a device called free write. And I want to hear more about this because uh, as someone who's done a lot of writing and loves to write, I also love to have distraction-free time to really dig deep into the work that I do. Um, so tell us more about this device and, and how it works and, and why it is so effective. Yeah, free write is our distraction-free writing tool that we originally came up with back in 2014 under the name of Hemingwright. And the concept came about from a discussion I was having with my co-founder 
um, who at the time we were both working on separate unrelated projects. I was working on an nutrition company and he was working on uh, something to do with solar. And we just happened to be sitting across from each other in an incubator space in Detroit. And he was telling me about some distraction free writing software that he used that disabled the backspace key. And I thought that that was just so wild, you know, to, to purposefully limit, you know, a feature like that in the name of productivity in some ways. And, and he sort of described it to me as though, you know, we're, we're sort of our own worst critic. And there's this whole concept within writing of drafting and editing in separate sessions. And so in that philosophy, you, the idea is you, you separate sort of the creative mind from the critical mind because they can get in each other's way. And so if you just focus on sort of the creative portion during the drafting process, and then you just focus on the editing portion in a, in a later process, you can kind of maximize your output for both. And so we created this tool called FreeWrite. At the time, it was just, again, it was a concept. And we thought, okay, well, if modern authors are using distraction-free software of various kinds to sort of limit their you know, their ability to access the internet or to get notifications on their laptop or tablet, maybe we could create sort of a dedicated tool that was very simple, just like these older technologies, like maybe a typewriter or word processor, and very simple, just like how your laptop acts with this distraction-free software, but then married it with even better sort of hardware components. So a great mechanical keyboard, a great e-ink screen, and that was the original concept. And so we we didn't really think much of it other than it was just seemed interesting and um we we eventually put it put together a prototype and this was back in 2014 and um that prototype went viral uh we had hundreds of thousands of people come to our little website we had press from all around the world just just talking about the concept it wasn't something that was out yet and so we thought like hmm if people are really that excited about this idea of a distraction-free writing tool, because that's how we marketed it. We we thought, okay, let's put a Kickstarter together. And that's what we did. And, and in December 10th, 2014, we launched our Kickstarter for the original free write. Actually, it was then called Heming Write, and raised 200000 in the first 20 hours and completely blew us away. We just were like, wow, this is something really unique here. I mean, again, like in my previous company before that, we were really trying to push product into the market. And this is the first time I've ever been part of something where it's like getting pulled. And so, you know, there was something there about creating something that was very different than what's out there in terms of consumer products. You know, this product, this idea was purposefully feature limited in the name of productivity, actually. And so not only was it distraction free, so no email, no browser, no notifications, but it was also part of this writing philosophy where you draft top to bottom and then edit later in a computer. And what that meant is that there was very limited limited editing capabilities. You could backspace, but that's it. There was no arrow keys. There was no copy and paste. There was no formatting. So it was very, very, very limited, but in the name of productivity. And that was the concept. And people got super excited about it. Um, fast forward to now, we have had writers that have published books. We've had something like over 100 million words have been written on free write devices worldwide. And we're just about, um, we're now shipping our new free write traveler, which is something we've been working on for the last two years, similar distraction free concept, um, but in a smaller folding, folding form. Um, this, it's about 1.6 pounds. So it's super slim. You can take it anywhere, hence the name traveler. And, you know, what we're trying to build upon is sort of this this base of people that have taken sort of their attention into their own hands and have realized that it's super important to, you know, have their own focus and being able to manage that themselves. And so this, this separate device, not only does it, does it function to be distraction free, but it also sort of gives your brain that like, you know, all the, 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 sort of like all the environment that is required to know that like, okay, when I'm using this, this is like for writing only. And so it, it's really show, been shown to work, which has been great. And, um, you know, I, I think that we're, we're just super excited that these products are out now. 
you know, the first thing that I thought of when you when you describe this product as like a very simple tool that is limited in features and you're trying to block all these, you know, common distractions, email, browser, notifications. When I wrote my last book, I tried something different, which is that I created a separate uh, user account on my laptop and that second user had no access to anything. And I was I was basically creating a mock version of what you already had available, yeah, that's, which is kind that's of interesting. interesting because I was I knew intuitively if I have access to these distractions, I'm going to access them. Like it's just my brain just will not let go of those things. And so once I if I, on the you know second user when I was ever trying to access Facebook or you know a news article, I, I would be blocked from those things and then reminded to go back to my work. But I'm curious in terms of those who've used free write and they're using a device that can't do anything intentionally like how does that work in terms of i'm assuming the flow state is better i'm assuming people can get into their work faster like have you heard um, user experiences where they can actually write better or faster or the quality is improved or what kinds of benefits are you seeing from those who are really digging into the device yeah i mean we've heard over and over again that people's writing productivity has doubled or sometimes even tripled and so again as part of the drafting process we sort of we, we think about it as actually qu- quantity over quality because of mm. that. And, and this is sort of what's, you know, what I hear is being taught in most like master's programs for writing. And, you know, really what you want to do is just write and write and write and write and write. You need to practice and you need to just get as many words out as possible. It's not so much about anytime you're, that you're curtailing or trying to like overthink it, it's better to just keep going. And so when when we were designing the product, we were really thinking about, quantity, you know, at its extreme, like how can we remove everything that doesn't have to do with helping writers just put words down on the page and keep moving forward? That was one of the most, you know, central guiding concepts of the product. Keep the writer moving forward. Yeah, I love that because I know that I I basically do kind of a a brain dump, so to speak, where I'm trying to get words out. But my natural tendency, I'm definitely an editor as I write. I love to go back and make corrections. And but that I know intuitively is holding me back. And so I love the fact that you're focusing there on quantity. Um, I guess one of the other things that pops in my brain right away is that I'm hyper concerned about backups and saving my work. Um, how does this tool ensure that you're and you're not going to lose what you've worked on? Yeah, and I mean that's super important because you know we want all writers to feel super comfortable with what they're doing. And I think you know because we're trying to sort of you know complement people's laptops, and we, I mean we have heard I've heard the craziest things that people do. You know in terms of like. They have all these backups on different USBs and the USBs are at their parents' house and one's buried (laughs) in the garden and, you know, and it's like, well, we have this great, you know, thing now called the cloud and I'm a huge fan of Dropbox, for example. And um, so, so very early on as part of the concept, we wanted to make sure that not only are all your documents safe and secure, but also that you can access them anywhere. And so we have direct integrations with um, Dropbox, Google Drive and Evernote, um, but not only do they are those being used, but the way that the device works is it's actually it's storing everything locally. So you don't need to be connected to the internet. It just uses the internet as a backup and also as an easy way to download your files and edit them later because that is part of the workflow. It's it's designed, you know, the device, like I said, is not designed to do everything. It's designed just for this drafting part of the process. And I love that you um, told that story about making a new user account because. I mean, this is sort of something that I realized as, as in my journey with making this tool is that after talking to so many writers, what I what I found out is that literally every writer has some process of trying to stay focused, and you know those processes vary widely in what they're and what they actually do. I mean, I've heard you know there's sort of these famous people like George R R Martin supposedly wrote you know Game of Thrones on an old DOS machine, um, you know if uh, Jonathan Franzen uses an old Dell laptop that does that doesn't have Wi-Fi, and the and he even goes so far as to put uh, glue in the Ethernet port just to <laughs> you know re- remove any element of temptation. And and there's countless of these stories. I think J.K. Rowling wrote a lot, if not all, of Harry Potter longhand, which really blows my mind. And so you know we heard from so many different people about how they go about their process of staying focused. And I think writing is such an interesting task because. You know, especially for creative writers, you know, quint- the quintessential problem is that they need to sort of create a world and stay within it. And I think, like, when you're talking about distractions, I mean, what does a distraction do when you're a writer? I think it it pulls you out of that world. And so I think that that's actually one of a huge, if not the biggest problem, other than, 
you know, putting words together and to form, you know, coherent sentences. So I, I think, you know, for, for writers, it, it really is super important. And that's why, you know, when we created this product, like we didn't, it, you know, it's not a toy, like it, it's really designed to be a serious writing tool. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's built and priced accordingly because, you know, we want people to actually make this part of their workflow. Oh, definitely. I can see the benefits there in, in incredible ways. I mean, I know one of the things that I would do is I would go to a, a local library here in Nashville where I live um, because I knew that library was a place where there'd be very few people around me. I could get my work done. I could stay focused. I mean, obviously there was Wi-Fi at the library, so it wasn't as if I was totally cut off from the world. Uh, but I love the idea of being like immersed in a focused environment. And I feel like th the biggest issue that I always had in those environments was the tool itself I was using. The laptop was my biggest issue uh, and my design desire to want to click buttons and, and move into other directions. So I love that this is really designed from the ground up to say like those things are not part of this process. Uh, what else do you see in terms of creating a space for for digging in deep into work? I mean, I, I mentioned here just kind of like going to a library, but do you have other things like music you listen to or places you go to work or like how else do you kind of cr you know create that really focused environment for yourself? Yeah, music is an interesting one because me personally, I know that I can't really listen. I, I can listen to music, but I can't focus on music. I can only focus on one thing at a time. And I think that's just like a personal trait. Like even I have a problem with like background, like when, when people have TVs on in the background, it sort of drives me crazy. Cause mm. like, I'll just listen to it even if, you know, like, you know, so for me, um, like the environment that I really need, I think actually one of the biggest things for me is ergonomics hmm. because I, I always see people, I, I don't know how people work on laptops, to be honest. Um, <laughs> I've been like a desktop guy with like monitors that are raised way up and sort of like following all the the principles of like how to sit and how to, you know, you know, be in a comfortable position for a long time. Because, you know, at the end of the day, like I'm a, like a, a, a typing warrior <laughs> and I spend far too much time in front of a screen. And so being comfortable, I think is just a huge, a, a huge element for me. I mean, also you know, being comfortable from like a temperature and humidity perspective. I think all of those things are sort of contributing. And then I think the other thing I've noticed is that sort of timing in the day, um, you know, different people have different, different patterns, but I've definitely found there's sort of like a sweet spot in my day and sort of in relation to, you know, when I wake up and also, you know, when I'm having coffee, but there's sort of like this sweet spot of three or four hours that I know that if I really need to do anything creative, like I need to just hunker down and do it during that time or else, you know, if I wait till four or five o'clock, I'm going to be just like dragging and not really want to do it. And it just takes so much more effort to kind of get into that like focus zone. And so I think like when it comes to environment, I mean, I think it's important for people to just, you know, try different things. And also, I think the biggest thing is actually probably just noticing what, what's actually working, you know, cause I think everybody experiences different states and a lot of times like it just happens, you know, quote unquote naturally, or, you know, in, in some sort of like unusual combination of, 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 you know, environmental characteristics. And I think if you sort of are paying attention to yourself, it's like, Oh, I feel really focused right now. Or, or I have a lot of energy. It's like, okay, well, what did I do in the last 24 hours to get, to get me to this state? Did I not, you know, drink last night and have a terrible <laughs> night's sleep? Or did I, you know, did I work out at a certain time? Or did I have a certain type of workout? Or did I drink a certain type of tea or whatever it is? And I think just like being mindful of that can really tell you a lot about how you can potentially repeat it in the future. Yeah, I mean, for me, that's the the ritual of work. I think that's one thing I've really focused on a lot over the years, and a lot of what this podcast is all about is is the daily rituals that we get ourselves, you know, permission to kind of lean into. You know, one of the things I'm mean, even right now doing this interview, I have my cup of tea with me that I always have when I do my recordings, and I'll make sure the environment is quiet. Like, I think that kind of the the practice of going through the motions like that every time gets you into that flow. And I know that the last thing you want is to like kind of build up all of that, you know, amazing, you know flow to then have it broken by distraction and broken by the tools you're using. I guess from that, then the next level up then for me, I guess for asking you now is when you're using a traditional computer with access to the internet, like, do you have other means of cutting distractions when you're using a traditional computer, like other tools to, you know, cut the internet off for yourself, or are you just allowing yourself free access at that point? 
I allow myself free access. I mean, there's so much stuff that I end up doing on the internet. I think, you know, I use, I use rescue time. Um, but it's more of a curiosity to me to see like what I'm spending my time on. Mm. Um, you know, I think, honestly, I think it's for me, I've been under so much pressure and deadlines for so long as an entrepreneur that I just have never, you know, I think since then I just, I just keep, you know, crushing through, (laughs) through work. You know, (laughs) I think, I I don't know, like I can look back into, um, you know, my jobs before I was, I was a full-time entrepreneur and there was definitely more temptation. And so I, I don't know, I think like, you know, ultimately, like when you really have a need to do something, you do it, mm, yes, <laughs> you know, or, yes. or you fail. Those are the two options. <laughs> I mean, it's sort of, it's funny, even in the writing world, like I've talked to a lot of journalists and, you know, real working journalists that are, you know, f- they have to write, you know, five or six articles a day. Like there's no such thing as writer's block to them. You know, mm, that's just, true. that goes away because they know that they just have to crank. And there's, you know, if, you, if you're if you not doing your job, if you're not outputting, like y- you won't last. I mean, you won't have a job. So I think like for me, I don't know. I, I've never had to really like limit my internet usage since, uh, since going on, you know, being an entrepreneur. I think the phone is a, sort of a different story. Um, I've, I've signed out of Instagram and I try to really limit myself from social media, but that's not so much a time thing. I think it's like an attitude thing. It gets that it sort of just gets in your head, I think, mm. and, and can prevent you from being in the right mind state. So that I definitely try to limit. Yeah. I just recently watched the documentary, the social dilemma, which I think highlights a lot of those same issues where like word we, if you change your mental state, too often with the wrong inputs. Yeah, it can really mess with your ability to get your right work done. But I love what you just mentioned about the idea of deadlines and, and pressure, because I think that in terms of the world of productivity, I know that's something that I traditionally, like personally don't like having a deadline that's that hard. But I know that when that exists, I get my work done every single time. Like it's almost impossible for me not right. to be productive because I have to be productive. Um, in terms of that, do you have any other tools or apps or gadgets that you use? Um, just, in, you know, mentioned Evernote earlier. Um, do you have anything else that you lean on that helps you to get your work done throughout the day? I have a lot of tools that I use in terms of just like the software and a hardware I actually use. I'll give you one example that I think, um, is probably, will probably think it seemed to be very crazy for most people's standpoints, but I use a, um, I've been using a gaming mouse for a long time. And the gaming mouse is this, this kind where it has like, I think it has 12 thumb buttons. Wow. And that, well, it gets crazier. So what I've realized is that I wanted to have more functionality out of the mouse. So I don't actually even know how I came up with this, but so I bought this gaming mouse and then I found out that the gaming mouse from Logitech, actually, you can also, not only can you program those 12 buttons, but you can also program them individually based on the program that you're, that's currently in focus. Whoa. So I have not all 12, but I have a lot of those buttons programmed for all of the major software tools that I use. So there's like macros basically for each of those buttons. That's incredible. That's, that's a level of, of productivity I have not yet heard. Um, how did you get, how did you get to that point? That's, I mean, it's, it seems logical that you say this. It sounds like an obvious point to get to to want to have more of that functionality. But I mean, I've used just a very simple one button mouse for years, and so the idea of having a dozen buttons and to program those per program, like how do you memorize them to know what the buttons do when you change apps? Well, one is practice, but two is I don't. I'm not like. Well, <laughs> I was going to say I'm not crazy about it, but so I am. I am crazy about it, <laughs> but. I sort of just do it naturally. Like, I think there's this process where, you know, there's even a thing like, you know, within programming, and I'm not a programmer, but, you know, most people say like, you know, if you have to do something more than once or twice, like, you know, find a way to automate it. And so I just sort of, you know, I built up sort of those macros and those shortcut keys over time. You know, I find myself like doing the same task over and over. And so then I'd be like, oh, if I need to like keep, you know, opening up a new email or keep sending this to like a certain folder in Outlook, um, I'll just program that to one of these buttons. And so it just kind of builds up over time. And so I'm constantly adding it, adding to it. And then if there's like a, a, a new program that I'm spending a lot of time in, then I'll 
you know, same thing. Like I'll start with zero and then sort of as I'm like working on a project, like maybe it's Lightroom or something, I will just add those those shortcuts to those buttons. And I think it partly came out of because I'm a big track point fan, you know, the little like nub, um, the nub mouse that's in a ThinkPad keyboard. Mm. And um, I really liked those. And I, I even had a chance to meet the guy who invented it, Ted Selker. And he was um, he was a professor in co- uh, at MIT when I was there, and I had a chance to talk to him. And the whole thing was the reason that that thing is so great is that it doesn't it doesn't require you to take your hands off the keyboard. So, and that's like I mean, it depends on how far you want to get into this stuff. But right, like there's this whole concept. Like if if you're reducing the amount of time to transition, then you're going to be faster. Yes. Right. And. If you think about how how often you're transitioning from mouse to keyboard, keyboard to mouse, mouse to keyboard, I mean, it's like a lot, right? And so mm-hmm. if you don't have to make that transition and you can just move your finger from the home row to this little nub to move your pointer around, you can be a lot faster. And so I sort of took that to heart as like, oh, well, that's pretty cool. Like, I'm going to learn how to use that thing. And it's not that hard. And people kind of like look down on it, but it's not that hard. So again, I'll, I'll reveal more of my insanity, but... <laughs> I bought a desktop version of one of those keyboards. So I actually sort of have two mice and two keyboards because my my main keyboard has a mouse in it and my main mouse sort of almost has a keyboard in it because it has so many buttons on it. <laughs> and it just allows me to kind of do everything, whether I'm in either position, either having one hand on the mouse or having both hands on the keyboard or whatever it is. Um, and it just, yeah, I mean, that's just sort of a way that I get to you know, I can be very productive. I'm going to need a picture of your setup. <laughs> I'm <laughs> I can so keep curious. Going. Yeah. <laughs> I can keep going. Well, what, what else you got? Keep going. Let's, let's hear this. So I also, I was uh, an early adopter, too early, um, for the like convertible tablets. So when I, went, when I went to college, which was in 2003, so that's a long time ago now, I bought a ThinkPad. It was like a, I want to, th- I want to say it was an X40. I don't know. It was a ThinkPad, but it was like their first one that had a convertible screen. So like you could op- you could flip the screen around and fold it back on itself on, on the keyboard to be like a tablet. And that was sort of like all the rage back then. And it really worked terribly, uh, which was very frustrating to me. It, it worked fine as a laptop, but the actual pen input was very slow and the key- it was underpowered and the whole thing. But one of the really cool things that sort of made it useful is that it had mouse gestures or actually it had um, stylus gestures. So you could hold the the button down on the pen and do like, you know, make an O and then that would be like the open command in whatever program you're working on. Or you could like swipe down to the left and that would like minimize and swipe down to the right would maximize. And so from using that, I sort of just kept using that even though I switched from that tablet thing to a regular computer and so now I use like a gesture program. I think some of them are actually built into Windows still, but I actually use a gestures program and just do some of the ba- basic ones where I hold the right mouse button down and make gestures um, instead of having to use certain key combinations or clicking certain certain icons. Yeah, I mean, I've used a similar feature to that um, on my Mac for a long time. I definitely, I know that when my wife and I have different, you know, Mac laptops and whenever I use hers, I'm instantly angry because all of her (laughs) settings are totally different than mine. And it's just this frustrating thing because like I'm trying to do something very basic to me, but yet because we use these technologies in such different ways, it is almost like a a foreign object to try to use. Yeah. Um, But yeah, I love the idea of customizing your setup to that degree where, I mean, literally whatever program you're going to use that often, you want to create a scenario where we can use it as efficiently as possible. I think that's, you've taken this to a whole new level, but I love what you've done here because I think that really speaks to the idea that if you are want to get the most value from your time, I mean, this is the way to do it. Yeah. I mean, I spend so much time in front, like working on my computer. Anytime I feel like something's kind of going slow or just annoying, then I try to think of a way to fix it. And that, I mean, that's part of my personality as well as just like a, you know, an engineer and, um, you know, I want to make it better. And so, I mean, I've also experimented a lot with different, you know, monitor setups, whether it's two or three or one or, you know, one big one or portrait. Now I have kind of a, 
I think my favorite so far, I have one large one in the middle and I have two portraits on one on each side. And that one, that's like pretty unusual also, but that's <laughs> yeah. like so far, I, you know, having now used, you know, two or more monitors since again, I don't know, probably for 15 years, I've gone through every different iteration. Um, and that's so far, I think that's my current favorite. So do you have certain applications open on each of those monitors separately? So you always know like one is always in a certain location or how, how is that set up for you visually? Yeah, I usually do. So I usually have like, well, now I'm using Slack, which is a whole nother con- <laughs> whole other, other conversation. Um, so I usually have like Slack and I'll have Evernote and Spotify, um, usually on like my left portrait monitor. And then, you know, my main monitors, whatever I'm working on. And then on the right is sort of like documents or something that I, you know, am using for reference. That's sort of how it goes. I don't have like real hard rules about it, um, but that's that's basically how I've been using it. And I'll tell you one thing, if there's any window of Microsoft people out there, the most annoying thing ever is that Windows has um, ways to like move your windows quickly to like just the left side of the monitor and just the left side and also just the like maximize, but it does not have a way to go to like the top of a portrait monitor. And it drives me crazy. Interesting. I have an, uh, an app on my Mac called Moom, M O O M that I've used for a long time that I don't know if I have a PC version or not, but it allows you the chance to uh, put your applications either full screen just to the left, just to the right, just the top, or just the bottom. And you can kind of position those around. I'm pretty sure it works with multiple monitors. I just use one big one now. But I think you can do a lot of different variations with that program. So maybe you can check that out for the PC as well. But I think there's a solution to that somewhere. I'm not sure what it is for the (laughs) PC. But I I definitely feel your pain on that one because I know that's that's an issue. Yeah, I there's there I know there's some other utilities out there and I've I've been, you know, as I've gotten older, I try to use less and less Windows utilities, you know, I'll, you know, these like weird programs that, you know, independent developers have created just cuz, you know, they end up having problems or, you know, becoming outdated and um but it's it's fine. I I, I make it work. So I've heard that you have a a sleep system that works well for people. And I want to dig into that a little bit as well, because sleep is a big aspect of, you know, waking up early, when to get things done. So what have you found that that's worked well for you? Yeah, I do. I do have a sleep system. And, and this is also something that it just sort of evolved over time. And now um, my wife loves telling everybody about it. She works in the yoga industry. She owns yoga studios and loves telling people about sort of my my new sleep system, which I've been using and and evolving over the years. But I think, you know, there's this, especially entrepreneurs, but it's not just entrepreneurs. It's it's it's, a, it's everyone. You know, people have this concept like, oh, you know, when I go to sleep, like my mind is racing. And it's like, yeah, okay, your mind is racing. Like that is a problem. But the the point is that, it's not, it's not like you have to learn how to relax. Like you you should think instead of thinking like falling to sleep, like I think of it as like you're relaxing to sleep. And so you need to really like let go of that mindset of like, oh, my mind is racing and I need to just like, you know, work it out. And it's like, no, you actually just need to relax and sort of like let it go. And this is also, I mean, I think people that study mindfulness and and meditation, it's, it's very similar, if not the same thing. So the the sleep system really has just three parts. And the first one is the one that sort of catches most people off guard, which is no screens in the bedroom. And I th- I think that this is super important. That means no phones, no computers, no tablets, and no TVs. And there's a whole concept of, you know, again, we were talking about like environments for your productivity. Well, environments are also super critical for everything else, especially sleep. And so if you want to think about like your sleeping environment, you want to have it sort of be as pure as possible. And and anytime that you have, I mean, especially a phone, the phone is the absolute worst. The phone I think of is just a pure anxiety machine. And so you don't, not only do you not want to have that just on, you know, people always say to me like, oh, well, I have it on do not disturb or I turn it off. And it's like, no, just like leave it in the other room, put it in your kitchen, put it in your front front room. It's so important to sort of like remove that that temptation. Because I mean, one of the things that people don't realize, and this goes along with, other forms of distraction is that we're actually using energy to sort of resist the urge of temptation. Mm, Good point. And so, I mean, that's also part of the reason that it's, it's just better to not have it at all. You're, you're, there's a part of your mind that just will, you know, basically relax if, if you, if you don't have those, those temptations to resist. 
And so putting the screen, any screens out of the bedroom will really go a long way to sort of removing the anxiety. And I think, um, and so then, you know, the next question that people ask is like, oh, well, my phone is my alarm clock. Like, how will I ever wake up? That's like, well, <laughs> you know, we, they created, you know, alarm clocks a long time ago and they're like $10 <laughs> and you can buy one. And they're super simple and very effective. But I, what I really like, and this is the other part of this, one of the other parts of the system is a light alarm clock. And this is another thing that I've sort of been using for since high school. I was one of these really crazy guys who set up a whole like um, home automation thing with X10. I don't know if you remember that. That was like huge at the, sort of the beginning of the internet. Um, this X10 system that would actually slowly raise up my floor lamp when it was time to wake up to go to high school. Because I realize, like, you know, when I'm ever, whenever I'm on vacation or, you know, even during the weekends, like, I'm always waking up with the sun and I always feel so much better when that happens. So, like, why should I use this noisy alarm clock? And so, after looking into it, I realized, like, oh, I could just, like, figure this out and do it. And I, that's how I woke up in high school and every day since. And so, I've had different light alarm clocks I have. Um, I still have the original one that I had in high school as well, which I thought was awesome. Unfortunately, they don't make it anymore. Um, but even the newer ones are okay too, but it's just so much better. And you, you no longer have that, like, I don't know, that like severe reaction when you, whenever you hear like a phone alarm going off, it just like, I don't know. Now when I hear it, I like totally like throws me off. It's just so painful. Um, and then the third thing, which is the piece that really helps you fall asleep, which I really love is a Kindle. Um, and the reason I like a Kindle, there's sort of a few, few reasons. One is the screen. The screen with a front light, the Kindle with a front light, allows you to use a very, very low light that doesn't bother your eyes versus an iPad or, or a tablet, which has to have a backlight, which is much, much brighter. Um, you can use a very low light, and you also don't need, to, you can turn off all the lights in your bedroom and just use the light from the Kindle. And this is hugely important because you can find that even just the act of like using a regular book and you know, like a, de a, a bedside lamp, you have to actually, you know, get up to turn off the light when you're, when you want to fall asleep. And even just that little bit of movement can sort of like shift your perspective enough to allow you to not fall asleep. So I actually just, I love having the Kindle with the front light. You turn off all the, all the lights in the room and you can just fall asleep with the Kindle and it'll turn itself off or you can just push the little button one while you're about to fall asleep. And it's great. And it's super, it's super lightweight, super easy to hold. You can take it anywhere. It's got all your books on it. I just think it's a fantastic, it's one of my favorite products ever. And I think it really lets you relax to sleep. And I think it's interesting once you start paying attention to it, you realize like I, I when I start reading at night and also I read fiction, which I highly recommend when I'm reading fiction, it's always like, I'll read like the first like three sentences over and over again, because I realize my mind is still sort of like thinking about the day or whatever. And I'm like, oh, I just read this, but I didn't actually read it. And then I read it again. And then once I actually read it for real, like I've actually shifted my mind to like the day to the book. I almost always like never last a full page, which is pretty <laughs> funny. <laughs> and, and now it's like I read every night and I get so little reading done, which is just, you know, it's, it's a funny th problem to have, but it's so incredibly effective. And I've even heard... Um, there's even just a little mind exercise you can do if you're having trouble falling asleep and let's say you don't have a book or a Kindle, but you can actually just think about sort of like fantastical things. Like if you think about, like if you create a story in your mind, um, and I think this is like a pretty fun exercise that I've even tried and, and, and anyone, you know, listening can try, but even just thinking about like creating some kind of silly story, like almost like a dreamscape it's surprising how effective that is at just sort of relieving yourself from the story of your day and sort of letting your mind sort of relax to sleep. And I found that incredibly useful, both, you know, it, Kindle is what I use, but if you don't have a Kindle, you can always just try that mind exercise. Yeah, these are great pieces of advice here. I love it. A, a couple of thoughts I had right away. Uh, first is that I use, uh, I think it's the Philips uh, Sunrise Simulator alarm clock. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've used a similar one for the last probably three or four years. And it is really incredible how just like the soft light that glows from that and the birds that chirp is a much more soft and easy way to wake up in the morning than it is to have a jarring alarm clock noise, uh, which I've come to hate for so many reasons. Yeah, me too. Um, 
The other thing was that you mentioned this idea of a dreamscape. I started um, watching like silly cartoons late at night just to get my mind off of the day. And like probably like what, 15 years ago it was Family Guy. And for some reason, I haven't stopped that. So I just, I'm old enough now to not watch Family Guy every night. But you, you once you figure out, like, like we just mentioned this idea, like if you can shift your brain to something that is not your day, not your stressors, it is incredible how fast you can then just like disappear into la la land and fall asleep, which I've found to be really effective. Yeah. And so like you really just sort of need to release your mind and just like let yourself relax and you will fall asleep. And and now I, again, like I sort of have built these three things again, it's sort of the, the light alarm clock, no screens in the bedroom and the Kindle. And like, it's so incredible how functional these are. And of course there's other things too, like don't drink caffeine before bed. I mean, if you drink alcohol, that's also going to impede your sleep, but you know, and you know, being dark and quiet and sort of all the other things that like people generally know about, you know, getting a good night's sleep, but it's so incredibly effective. And I think really like relieving the pressure from yourself to like, you have to fall asleep at a certain time. And, um, you know, all of these things, like if you just follow these three things, which are very simple, um, and are very worthwhile investments, you know, you can get a good night's sleep and you can actually sleep all the, through the night. Yeah, which is huge. And that's kind of the, the bigger issue there is like not just falling asleep, but staying asleep and getting the quality of sleep you want. Um, Adam, it's been great. I am so just like fired up to get my um, like computer set up in a different way now and to buy fancy <laughs> m- mice and keyboards and whatever else I can. I'll be sure to share it. Yeah, definitely. I think our listeners would love to see uh, more of a setup of what we've got going on, as well as with free write. Obviously, that's a phenomenal tool for anyone who wants to do, do more distraction-free work. Um, so I want to make sure that they can learn more from you and, and get access to these tools. So so where should they go? Yeah, so all the information about the new traveler is at getfreewrite.com forward slash traveler, and that's with one L. Um, and all of our products are at getfreewrite.com. And, um, I don't see, sell any sleep products, but, uh, <laughs> soon you, you know, will. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I, I, w- I've probably sold, I don't know, 10 or 20 Kindles already just from recommendations That's to friends true. and family <laughs> and bought them for friends and family, but I would highly rececommend one of those as well. But, um, yeah, that's, that's where you can get them get freewrite.com. Okay, perfect. I'll make sure we have links for all of those resources this week in the show notes page. And uh, Adam, once again, thank you so much for all this great advice. I- I'm excited to dig into more of my own kind of side of being a productivity junkie. There's a lot here to dig into. So thanks a lot. Thanks, Jeff. I really appreciate it. And for that great action step this week, go get your free rights or the free right traveler today. Or at the very least, figure out how to guarantee a distraction-free environment to write and get your work done. Now, I can personally attest to the fact that writers who sit and write get more work done than those who do not. So make a plan to get to work. And for this week's show notes page, go to jeffsanders.com slash 364 for links to all of the free write devices. That's all I've got for you this week here on the show. Until next time, you have the power to change your life. And the fun begins bright and early.